We back. The return. Yeah. Just like Michael Thomas coming back in the fourth quarter, the ashy knuckle boys are back. I don't know who Michael Thomas is. Just use on um, your Google search button, number 13. I like the New Orleans Saints. Anywho, we talk about some MMA action, so let's get it. Let's, um, I don't know. This, this last card, it got blown up. We put back together and then love the matchups. Card itself. Uh, I'd say I'm going to say B minus. Good, but not hangover worthy. Like it was just, just good. A lot of controversy um, with it, though. Yeah, you? I got mixed feelings about some of the mix ups. Like after the whole controversy with it, having Tony Ferguson versus Nate Diaz, I think is the match that should have been. Instead of him versus Chemayev in the first place. But I also don't feel like it was a good matchup between Holland and Chemayev either. So, I don't know. I'm a little mixed on that one. I think the person that got screwed the most was uh, Jangling. <laughs> Yeah, I think, he, I think he got like triple fucked because like he bought the, the cool ass suit. He was ready for mm. his press conference, mainlining the uh, you know his, his main event press conference. He learned a little bit more English. He was ready to use it, mm. and they canceled. <laughs> they ended up canceling the um, the press conference because of the bullshit that happened. That ended up making the fight hard change right. Mm -hmm. Then. <laughs> He gets matched up with D-Rod instead of his original opponent, which was Holland, right? Yeah. Right. He gets D-Rod on short notice. D-Rod looked like a fucking tank, man. D-Rod looked like a 205er. <laughs> I know he mm -hmm. missed weight, too, which was like he was like the 19th guy on that card that didn't make weight. Right. Wait, wait, was it like only two people made weight? No, I mean, there was a good amount of people that... Uh, Nate made weight. <laughs> yeah. Like half the card made weight. I guess. I mean, <laughs> the premium guys got it right for sure. But uh, the headline for all like, uh, they're going to eat. We eating good. Fuck it. We balling. Yeah. The ladies made weight, right? Uh, no. One of them missed. I don't remember which one, though. Macy. Macy missed. Macy missed? Yeah. Yeah. My God. What are they? Yeah, I remember. She's, um... Man, that card. Well, I'm, I'm just going to start from this one. Like I said, I think Jang Lane got triple fucked. The first two, like I said, he missed his press conference, and then he got matched up with D-Rod. And then in the fight with D-Rod, uh, I thought it went – I thought it was going Jang Lane's way it should for the most part in the first round. I had I had the first round um, for Jang Lane. I had a 10-9. He did a good job with movement. He did a good job um, with his leg kicks. He landed some decent um, – a couple of decent strikes here and there. It was an overall lackluster round, really, so it wasn't like anybody ran away with it. But I did give the nod to um, Jing Wang for activity, and um, overall, I thought he just had a better round than D Rod. D Rod looked like he was stuck in the mud. Um, the second round, though, D Rod pressured a lot more and landed some really good jabs. His boxing was pretty decent, but not not enough volume so i'd say like edge would go to d rod in that one jang lang did a lot of backing up and a lot of like evasive movements instead of um and trying to engage in a, in a firefight which i i don't blame him for not wanting to get into a firefight with a dude that looked like a tool fighter <laughs> and he turned into a wrestler that round too and it got that <laughs> takedown right right oh you sure did yeah that second round yeah mm -hmm. did but I, I still gave the edge to D-Rod um, in the second round. Third round was pretty much clearly D-Rod, in my, in my opinion. I think he had the most significant um, moments in third. And I guess that's what weighed the most on judges' minds. A lot of people um, were a little bit upset at the decision on the D-Rod. Um, I don't even think 
Daniel Rodriguez thought he won that fight. But at the same time, um, I'm just saying, like, that's, that's the third way I think Jang Lang got fucked. I think he got fucked by the refs. No, nah, I mean, not the refs, sorry, by the judges. Um, he didn't do himself any favors in the third round, though. But he got, he, he just canceled press conference, had a cool ass suit, got matched up with D Rod, and in the fight, he ended up uh, getting. Not getting a nod for a decision when it could have went to him, um, and on some people's in some people's minds. So, yeah, Jing Ling, I think, had the worst of this card. I could okay. agree with that. Knock the fuck out or so. I don't know. He definitely Holland. got the worst of the shuffles. I don't know, Holland. Well, okay. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Mark. With Holland, it was kind of like, you know, he. He agreed to it. He knew it was a terrible fight for him. And from what I understand, he basically got his win and loss bonus anyways, just for accepting it. Oh. So they were like, you get your win loss plus 30% because Chemayev, you know, missed weight. Oh. So. That's a win. <laughs> I, like, you knew you were going to take the L, but you got you got an extra payday, you know? <laughs> Like, you knew you were going to get your win pay plus 30%. You know, why not? And 30% of Chemayev's, uh fight purse is probably more than Holland makes. Um, I agree with Mark on, I think, that was a come up for Holland. I don't think he suffered at all because, like, I mean, if you think about it, nobody expected him to win. Mm-hmm. Especially if you're fighting Hamza Chimaev on one day notice, no way, buddy. I mean, even if he had a full camp, he would still be an underdog. Um, I think he would fare better for sure, but on one day notice, no way. Um, he got pretty much ragdolled and, and squeezed out <laughs> within a minute. So um, he, for a minute worth of work, got paid, like you said, his his money, the win money, and then some of the um, – some of the, the fight purse for missing weight um, for Chemayev, who missed by fucking eight pounds. What the fuck? Like, come on. What, it's crazy how, like, we'll talk, I'll talk about that actually later. We'll, we'll get into that whole thing later. But I'll just go back to Holland. It's weird that, like, he didn't seem as if he was coming in the, like, even in the pressers. It was almost like, oh, I'm, I'm getting paid anyway. And this is just going to be. It doesn't. It doesn't count toward his record. It's a, it's a, it doesn't. Well, I'm sorry. Officially, it does count toward his record, but it's it's a catchweight fight. So it's like it's not going to matter to award any kind of title aspirations. Which, I mean, I don't know if he has any anyway. But it's it's basically like just a a, a, a money grab, and that's what it seemed like. Like I'm going to get get this paper, get this check, and then no big deal. I think at the end of the day, he's just a company man. The company needed a solid done, and he did it, and they rewarded him for it in a certain sense. But I mean, even when you, I think it was at the weigh-ins where they were interviewing him, they were like, "Is this a good matchup for you?" And he was like, "Fuck no!" Like, <laughs> like of course not. This is a terrible matchup, basically. And he knew it. He he was coming in to strike with somebody, and then all of a sudden he's got like one of the biggest wrestlers <laughs> or grapplers. It, you know, it's it was a terrible matchup, and he he knew it. Yep, that's for sure. Imagine you training for um, Daniel Rodriguez for three months, and then on the day of the fight, basically, or the day before the fight, um, they're like, "Oh no, no, you're not fighting Daniel Rodriguez. You're fighting Hamza Chimaev." Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so it's like such a different style, a different approach. For sure, and then obviously, um, Chimaev has proven to be one of the best wrestlers in the division. Um, Competition-wise, I would say it's a little bit untested. Obviously, I mean, it's only I mean, Kevin Holland. Rest, Kevin Holland's wrestling is not good. His wrestling defense isn't isn't very good. And then the other guys that he's you know, I mean, he did ragdoll Jingling. Right, but he hasn't faced anybody in the top five outside of obviously Gilbert Burns, and mm-hmm. that fight he couldn't dominate with wrestling. 
So yeah. you, if you look at like, is he? My 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 thought was like, everyone is saying like he's this juggernaut that just can't be stopped, and I'm like, mm, I don't know. Still, even though I do believe in his potential, I do believe he has the skills. I mean, the Burns fight said a lot for him, right? He got he proved that he is uh, able to compete with the top of the division. So I give him respects for that, even though I wasn't a huge believer in him before. Like, I was firmly on the he-need-to-be-tested side. And even though... I I think it proved... It showed that he's human and he can be beat, but it also proved that he can compete with the top guys. So I I can't hate on him too much. Yeah, um, let me turn my notifications off um yeah man i i thought for sure that comes out has the like he has everything you want from a championship caliber fighter except for two things any make championship weight any make 170 mm-hmm. yeah, i mean if you, you're not gonna be able to be champion if you can't make 170 consistently um and also his level of competition like I would love to see him now against top of the division. I mean, I want to see him matched up with Kobe. I want to see him matched up, you know what I mean, with the guys in the top five now. We've seen what he can do outside of that, and he's been clearly fucking dominant. Like, clearly. Like, he ragdolled. He, the guys that he was supposed to ragdoll. I mean, so let's see what it looks like in a step up in competition before. Because a lot of people are, I don't know, most MMA fans feel like he's the uncrowned king of 170. I still need convincing. I I see his trajectory going the same way as his best friend right now. I think he is the Swedish Till. Did I freeze up? Yes. Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah, that's weird. That's a beautiful photo of me. But, um... (laughs) <laughs> I, I feel like he's going to go the same way as Till, where he's going to be very dominant at 170, might get a title shot, might get shot down, and then have to go to 85, and doesn't look as dominant at the top there. They already talking about him uh, possibly going to 85 only. Because that bad way that Hamzat? It's what? Hamza, I think uh, to be to be real, I will say this: I think his I think his um, potential for getting championship is higher at one seventy. I don't think he's gonna. I don't think he competes at one eighty five for the title. I think they're already setting we'll it up. The whole thing yeah. with uh, Paulo Costa, the week of the fight, right. You know, it could be already in the making. That's how I look at it. I didn't know they had any issues. Did you guys know? What is happening here? What's What's that, Mo? Did you know if uh, Hamza and Paulo had any issues prior to their little uh, running during fight week? Only online, they, they was talking. They would talk shit to each other on like Twitter, oh, Twitter beef. Yeah, that's what I think. That's what it's all. It all stemmed from like that whole interaction was um like they were at the UFC PI. Yeah, and he just confronted him about it. Like, here's my thing: the cage was open. Exactly. So like, if if Hamza really wanted to like on site him and all that shit he could just walk around like walk around like he didn't it, it, it was like but i think it was more um for promotion obviously like you can have i think these guys are smart yeah a lot of these guys um all the, the none of these actions are just um out of pocket i think they have a it's like a game plan they're trying to create drama and create sound bites to promote future matchups, and I think you're right. I think um, Paula thing, that Paula Costa thing is like right in line. He doesn't have an opponent lined up, and 
what's, what? Why not Gabby? That's a perfect match. Like uh, it's for I, eighty-five, I'd love to see that. I think that and the, they already have the storyline. So yep. Especially if he goes up the middleweight. He beat him, then he yeah. might get a shot at uh the title. That'd be more yeah, fresh mean, it, uh, it, fighters for Izzy. Exactly, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Because like, if, if think, okay, think about it this way: it, let's say he does go up to eighty-five, right? I would say he's still two fights away from a title shot. Um, obviously, Izzy's already um. Booked with Pereira, right? Yep. With, with, you got Alex coming up. Um, and then Whitaker just beating everybody. Yep. So Whitaker's like permanent, permanent number one contender, basically. And I think all roads to Izzy have to go through Whitaker. So I feel, personally speaking, I wouldn't. I would love to see Whitaker Izzy three. What would that be four now? Would be three. It would. It would be four. Wait, three, 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 three. three. My bad. Three. Maybe because yeah. Um, but before that, um, I would love to see how Chimaev would do against Whitaker. I would love to see how he would perform against um Paulo Costa. I mean, if he steamrolls Paulo Costa and then you know, gets in there wreck shop, then yes, give him his type of shot. He uh, already talked about uh, Robert Whitaker at the post-fight press conference. Nothing bad. He said he liked him. He wants to train with him, stuff like that. But if he has to fight him, he'll fight him. Okay. That's what his, I believe that's what his response should be. And personally speaking, I like him. I think I think old boys. Um, I, I like Shemaya's potential. I just want to see it tested. Um, I think that he can be. I think he can, he can be um, an elite level, one hundred eighty five pounder. I, I know. I think one seventy might be a little bit too much for him. He might. I mean, obviously, he's not going to get any younger as time goes on, and it's, it's already hard for him to make with the weight cut. I think it's just like going to be a harder and harder and harder. I mean, why not just stay at eighty five? And improve like on the skills, and then get you know in position to compete for a championship, as opposed to trying to kill yourself to get at eighty five. I mean, at one seventy. Um, and even some of the top one seventy matchups. I, I mean, how does he fare against Kobe in a five round fight? I don't know. I I would if he better not gas know that much. Exactly. Hey, you know, Kobe, you know Kobe ain't gonna, gonna do no uh, man. You know, Kobe's gonna keep the pressure on. Force him to use that gas tank, and then he, he's not going to be able to rag. I don't think he's going to be able to rag dog Kobe. I don't think so. I think Kobe's wrestling is legitimate, so it's going to be um, that. That's one of those fights where, like, obviously, you see, when you saw him against Burns, he couldn't keep Burns down. And Burns isn't really Burns is more of a jiu-jitsu guy. He's a lightweight too. Right. You get what I'm saying? He he fought that lightweight. Mm-hmm. He's a lightweight. Right. I mean, but I, 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 think, I think Burns is a legit 170, though. Like, I don't think he's a, he was a just small cutting guy weight. 170. He was just cutting weight, to, I guess, for the uh, advantage. Like Chael says, you don't uh, drop down and wait for top competition. You drop down to avoid top competition. That's right. Makes sense. To me, um, if you look at the, the top of the division, the top of the division in 170 is basically you got Usman, Leon, Kobe. That's your, that's your three guys at 170 pounds. And I think um, all three of those guys, you, you're not going to be able to ragdoll them. So you're basically going to have to, it's going to be a kickboxing fight or it's going to be a long, grueling fight. And I would say Edge goes to all three of those guys in a long, grueling fight from what I've seen from Shemayev so far. You know, we haven't seen him in a lot of five-round action, and we haven't seen him up against top-tier competition. 
So that's what makes me feel that way. Now, can he um, do it? Does he have the tools? I think he has the tools to do it. Sure, like the he has everything you want. Like he has the he has size, he has the athleticism, he's aggressive, he's powerful, he can finish. He has the tools. Um, but we just gotta see it done against top comp for me to be um to consider him a, a uncrowned king. I don't think he's an uncrowned king. I think to me, he's a rising star with championship potential. I don't think he is like I guess like the reason why I'm saying this is because the, when Usman wasn't the champ, when when Woodley was the champ, everybody kind of avoided Usman because they're like, this guy is the guy. Even though he doesn't have the gold, he is the guy. So he was basically, he would get ducked a ton. And then even now as champion, I mean, like he was until Leon hit him with the headshot dead. <laughs> Yeah, you know what I mean, he was on his road to being being considered um, one of the greatest welterweights of all time, and that 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 book is still um, that that chapter's not closed in my mind. I mean, hell of a job by Leon, but I still think Usman's the man. It's just like GSP when he lost to uh, Matt Hughes before, and then Matt Sarah later on, he came back and did his thing. Yeah, the the only difference in that is both of those happened early, early on. In his career for GSP, I think it was like the worst timing for Usman to lose at that point because Leon Edwards basically took away a lot of the records that he could have. All the consistency records, like longest title reign and uh, longest win streak and all that, those are all gone because he has to start over now. And it's a tough thing to do to get to 12, 13, 14 fights straight. Right. Like, so here's my thing, man. Yeah, those, all those things for news and for, like, media, they, they mean a lot. But when it comes down to it, I I personally believe that Leon is a championship caliber fighter. I believe that he even in the, in the first fight when they when the skills were a little bit uh, they, they they both were still like a little bit more undeveloped. Like back in the first matchup, Usman was more of a, just a wrestler, a pure wrestler. It had punching power. And and then Leon was just a, a kickboxer who was grappling was a little sus. That still was a close match. And you look at now, like, Leon's evolved way past what he was that long time ago when they did fight the first time. And then so did Usman. And that, I think that fight was for real a, a whole display of that. Like, we saw Usman getting taken down for the first time in his career. We saw him get knocked out for the first time in his career. He got his only his second loss in his mixed martial arts career. Um, Leon... Put on like even though like he was getting dominated for most of the fight like Usman was being Usman but the guy we mm -hmm. expected the the, the Walter Wade go we that's what we saw from most of the fight but that one moment where he got that he got set up and Leon caught him with the head kick that's all it takes you know what I mean for a high level striker like that and you know, it's kind of funny if you go back and look how like. Same story happened with him and Nick, Nate Diaz, where Nate got dominated for the entire fight, but land that one punch, rock Leon. If he finishes Leon there, it's a whole different narrative, a whole different story. Leon finished Usman. Like, Usman was dead on the, on the, on the canvas, you know what I mean? So I think that's the difference in, like, when you, you get, when you have this, that, I think he's deserving, he's deserving to be champion. How long will you hold on to that belt? That's the real question. I mean, you got also got to be honest with about Leon too, though, because before he got the belt, nobody was really defeating him either. He was having a hard time. People were avoiding fighting him too, because they always considered him high risk, low reward. You know, but now he's champ. His biggest rival is definitely Usman again. So if 
there's a good chance that Usman comes back and takes his belt back. But other than that, he matches up pretty well with the rest of the division. Oh, yeah. I, I agree. Exceedingly well. I would yeah. say, if you, if you, like, I think he matches up very good with Kobe. He matches up very good with um, who his obvious money fight would be. Would be obviously who's, um, not Usman. Uh, Usman, in my mind, is the next contender, period. But if you're looking at, let's say he wins. Let's say he beats Usman, right? Let's say he goes in there and just gets a decision victory. Let's say he doesn't, nothing crazy, but he just beats Usman the second time um, for, in, in the trilogy. The obvious money fights for him are three. I see three names. Um, the biggest name is Masvidal in London, right? Like you have that two-piece in the soda thing, three-piece in the soda thing. Obviously, people go, well, people will argue that Masvidal doesn't deserve it. He doesn't deserve a title shot, but no one cares what you deserve. It's entertainment as well as it's competition. That fight would probably sell pretty big, I would, I would assume, um, given like the history. And then Kobe, right, would be next. And then also, what if Connor wants a crack at 170? It, it, that would sell. If it, and Connor could easily get a like a, a 170 title match, a title um. You know that we we know he'll get um a title shot whenever. It doesn't matter if he's winning or not. Like, or if he deserves it or not, it's not important. It's definitely happening in London. I'm telling you. Yeah, it's definitely got to happen in London. And I mean, you're right. The biggest fight over there besides Usman would be Masvidal, money wise, just because they can use that promo. But I don't know if the UFC is going to do that because they've been pretty quiet about Masvidal for a while now, too. They haven't been hyping him about anything. Probably going to fight Conor. The good thing for Masvidal is something crazy always... Something crazy happens every 15 seconds. Yeah. So, like, so, like, your controversy can get buried in the crazy news cycle of just crazy other shit happening. Like, um... All you gotta do is just wait. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like just just wait and be quiet, and you'll be all right. But yeah, he's he's probably not gonna live that Kobe thing down for a little while. But it, in a way, it kind of adds to already what he's known for anyway. He's known for being this like, you know, this Miami brawler. This, I mean, that's his whole his whole story. That's his origin story. That's how he got his claim to fame. With even with Leon, it's a two piece and stuff. Uh, whatever. I don't think it like really hurts him too much, but for the the UFC PR machine, I think they just they're quiet on him because they know that something crazier is going to happen that'll take the news. As long as you're quiet. But I think they're also quiet on him because, unfortunately, the matchups that would make the most sense for him aren't entertaining enough. So they just not doing it because they there's just better matchups right now this is the best odds for him i mean li- literally the best thing for masvidal would be for edwards to beat uzman the second time because you know that's the matchup they're going to make unless one of them can't get to the fight and then that's the like his best odds in all honesty and he just has to hope that conor mcgregor doesn't want to fight leon or chamayev that's his other obstacle. Chamayev could rock or get another win. Say he fights Covington and then beats Covington. They're going to give him a title shot. That's so, so what do you think? Dance okay, let's, 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 mm-hmm. let's it's a three-way dance with the top at the division. Yeah. Oh, what do you... What do you see happening though with uh, Leon if Usman beats him in this second fight? I mean, I mean, this third fight. So, let's say Usman beats him, where does Leon go? I think he goes back to, you know, back of the line. And it'll probably be, depending on who Kobe fights, if he fights Chemayev at 170. Uh, if Chemayev wins, he'll probably fight Usman. You don't think that Leon could put up a good enough fight to get a trilogy out of that? It, it's going to be a trilogy. 
Is it, it'll be the third time they fight. <laughs> well, I, I it's guess one one. Right oh, that would be that would be the third time they fight. You're right. You're right. It's one one. I, f- I always forget about that first one. <laughs> it was so long ago. I thought you would mean like a title trilogy. Um, well, that's what yeah, I was meaning, but yeah, I forget about their first fight. They already. This is already um, going to be the trilogy mm-hmm. in, in their series, but as a title, no, this will be um, only the second time they matched up in the title fight. I don't think he goes that um, far back, though, if he loses. He'll be like one win away from getting a, another crack at it, though. That's how I see it. I don't, know, I don't know how far back he goes, though. I don't think he goes back too far. No, no, no. He'd be in top three. Still, he'll fight the loser of whoever Kobe fights next, and that's and Kobe's not booked with anyone, so nope. who knows? It could be just Kobe. Well, he had a what? What did he say? He broke his tooth or something? He having mm-hmm. issues because Masvidal beat him up so bad, or something? Something like that. And then also, you know that he's not that active anyway. Kobe's not very active regardless. Like, he doesn't fight three times a year anyway. So, if you... It's, like, kind of on par for his whole schedule. He only wants to fight matchups that make sense for him, like aging vets and title fights. He's not trying to get a fights. I know where he's at, I mean, though. Where he at? No, where he's at, too. He at the poker room right now. <laughs> that boy playing cards. I mean... This this is also a good scenario for Kobe Covington, right? Because he wasn't going to get another shot at Usman. So, his best bet is to get fucking Edwards to win again, too. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That's if uh, Chimaev stays at 170. I don't think they... Uh, mm. They might force him to fight 185 as next one, but one good win, then they'll be like, well, you can do whatever you want. Kind of like they did with, uh, who was that? A while back. Oh, Gaslam for a little bit. I see uh, that fight being a main event. I don't know if it'll be a pay-per-view main event, but if Chemayev and Kobe fight, it's definitely five rounds. It's not going to be three rounds. I don't see it no other way. I'm not at all interested in seeing Shemaya fight any more three round fights at this point. Like from from now on, I want to see if anything, he should be on some like either co main event or main event versus top competition in a headlining situation. Yeah. I don't see, I see no need for him. Any more three rounders, um, really? Because I mean, he's he's already showcased his talent. We know what he is now at this point. Like, he he's he's gonna ragdoll you, squeeze you out. Uh, in in Mirch in Mirchart's case, he knocked you out with one punch, and he's a phenomenal talent. So I think at this point, going forward, there. I mean. Right now, I will only want to see him match up against the top of a division in whichever division he's in, if he decides to be in. Makes sense for 85. 70 doesn't make sense to me because he can't make 70. He can't make weight. And he's not going to get, like I said, like, he's not getting younger. It's not going to get easier to make weight. I think I would give him more leeway if it wasn't by like almost eight pounds. You know? Right. Because this wasn't a title fight, so therefore. Technically, eight pounds is still nine pounds over making title weight. Exactly. If he was like he one or two weight. pounds over, I think I'd give him some leeway, but I, not fucking nine. Right. If he came in at one seventy three, no big deal. Yeah. Well, no, one 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 seventy eight or whatever. You did you even try? Like you know what I mean? Hey, he didn't look drained or nothing, right? Even though the doctors yeah. told him to stop cutting weight so early, but still. Like how early did they tell him to stop cutting weight? That morning? And he was that that like that many pounds over, or did he start eating or something? Probably started hydrating back up. Well, he said that they told him to stop. And then after they told him to stop, they told him he had to start drinking water to rehydrate. 
So, therefore, that's why he was so much over. The conspiracy theories are running wild with that. Yes, exactly. There's there's a lot of hate about it. I, I do think it's slightly unfair that it's all going to Jemayev because, as we spoke about earlier, half the card missed weight, half the main card missed weight. So... <laughs> It's like, uh, maybe maybe there's another leeway there. Maybe the scales were off, which I'm surprised that one hasn't been thrown out there yet. Maybe the doctors were going crazy and just like, no, y'all aren't drinking enough water. Yeah, who knows? Maybe we should uh, talk about our dear friend Nate Diaz on his way. Who got, who got his... Uh, the best case scenario out of all those mix-ups? Yes. He got he got hooked up. Even though that should have been the fight to begin with, but he got hooked up. Mm-hmm. 100% he is the absolute winner of this card. Oh, yeah. In my head. Because not only did he get a good matchup against a ranked opponent that he respects, and it's a matchup that actually makes sense for him to go out on. And he got a winnable matchup. So, he is the absolute winner of this card. Oh, I was going to say was that is that his first time getting submitted, Tony Ferguson? No, Oliveira. No, Oliveira did. He tried to break his arm off and he still didn't tap. Did he not tap? I think that went all three rounds of just being dominated. Then it might be. Because it went, uh, he lost to Gaethje. Then I think it was Oliveira. Then it was, uh, Dariush. And then he got, uh. Knocked out. He got field goal kicked by Chandler. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was besides Nate. Did you see the know. timing? Time did you see what? the time in which he got subbed? Nah. What was the time? When it was two oh nine on the clock. You're kidding me. It's serious. Wow. It was the fourth round, wasn't it? Not the fifth. I believe it was the, it was fourth, the fourth round. round. Mm-hmm. And it said two oh nine. It was at two oh nine. Wow, that's hilarious. How crazy is that? Stop them, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> More that's conspiracy kind of theories. <laughs> and that's this one guy uh, I talked to on on Twitter. He does like a uh, we do like little uh, MMA spaces, or whatever, and we uh, just random MMA, MMA chat. But this dude was like <laughs> fucking all over the place. He, he said uh, <laughs> he thinks that it's completely scripted because of how the way um, Macy Chess on fight, how that ended. And it ended right before the over hit. It was like a few seconds before the over being hit. And she just basically, you know, he thought it was like a fake shot. Like she didn't really get hurt. And it basically, it was like scripted. And then also the 209 one, like it's like proof to him that it's completely scripted. Oh my God. That's like I was telling uh, Mark earlier how uh, Hamzat became the heel of uh, the UFC. Like how Hulk Hogan went from being uh, red and yellow, then he came back with the NWO and he was like black and white and became the villain. So He had to be. He's the scripted. fake gangster now. It's scripted. All it's of all it's scripted. Set up. He got booed the whole way through, right? For his yeah. fight, Hamzat. I couldn't hear nothing. I was at work driving around. Yeah, he got booed quite a bit, but the fight wasn't very long itself. But his whole walkout, he was definitely getting booed. Well, we know where Nate's going after this. He's going to go look for better opportunities. What do what you guys think Tony should do? Because he, he said he's he's back, but I don't know. Tony should retire. He's back, though. I... He's been in three different camps for his last three different fights. He hasn't looked the same since his breakdown. 
a while back, and Gaethje stole his soul. So, as much as I love Tony, he's just his time was passed. Unfortunately, his his prime and where he was at his best, there was so much crap going on in the division to where he couldn't shine to his fullest potential. I still think that a prime Tony would have been the best matchup for Habib, but by the time he got to his title shot, his legit title shot, it was just too late. That fight never happened. Ever. Right. Try five terms. I think um, <laughs> the interesting fucking case of Tony Ferguson, bro. <laughs> I, it's for me, I think he's just too much damage. That's all mm-hmm. it was. Like he just he was he's a great fighter, but unfortunately a lot of his epic, beautiful comeback wars that he was in, he took a lot of fucking damage. Like even like, you know, the Pettis fight, he took a good bit. He took a good bit in the Kevin Lee fight. Um and this was all his like some of his prime time like, great wins, and then if you, even if even some of the other fights, if you look back into his career and all all of his notable wins, it's like he he rarely had a fight where he was just like steamrolled and out of there, where he was just dominant the whole way through. It was always some kind of back and forth type war mm-hmm. for Tony, and then you know that I think that accumulated damage over the course of a long career just kind of caught up to him and this is why we see the Tony we see now obviously you mentioned the one you mentioned earlier I mean come on Gaethje fight was insane and you also got to put into account right now he's trying to go to 170 at this point and I do not see favorable matchups at 170 at all for him no like his best bet at 170 is for ranked opponents, no. uh, <laughs> Neil Magny might be an interesting fight, but even I think that's going to be a tough one for him because he's too tall. Tony? Yeah. Yeah. At 170. Yeah, 170, because that's what he wants to come back at ever since he went to Greg Jackson. I mean, it makes sense because he's older, so it's going to be tough. It's, tough. it's probably tougher for him to get down to 55, but he's in the same, I think he's in the same exact situation that Diego Sanchez was in. I mean, yeah, you can't make 155, but you're going to get murdered at 170. Yeah, but, and I hate to say this, I really hate to say this, uh, but at least with Diego Sanchez, Diego Sanchez was willing to take, you know, unranked opponents and still have exciting fights with them. But I think with Tony, I don't, I don't think he can have those anymore. Like I, I think he's just too far gone at this point. And I, I'm a big, I'm a big believer. Like I, I fight for Frankie Edgar all the time now, where I know that Frankie Edgar's not going to have a championship run or title fight. But at least every time he's losing, he's competitive in the fights and he's in the top five, top ten. Tony is not showing that anymore. You know, they should just rebook oh. the Jingalang fight. Then they can do it. That's possible. They both coming off a loss. It's very possible. Mm-hmm. I, I I take back what I said. I do see some interesting matches up for him at one seventy, but it's not in the top, not in the ranked part. I think he would be perfect. Um, for newcomers, guys who are just like getting introduced to the division. Because if you think about it, like you're going to get some excitement in the fact that you're getting this unfamiliar person and with a, with an aging vet, and if Tony, you know, does well, then you, you can. That's that's another. You have another named opponent. I mean, a named fighter that can fill up a card in the one seventy division. Yeah. Um. I and mean, who knows? Like I, I, I hate to put caps on um, guys because I mean it is the fight game. 
And the difference between the guys who are at the top and the guys who are in the middle is just so small. It's just one little opportunity here, one little landed shot there, one sub here. And we're talking about like a whole different thing. You know, if, he, if Tony goes on a crazy streak again, which I mean, it's probably not fucking likely. But yeah. let's just say something crazy happens, right? Like he starts fighting all these like up and comers and bodying them all, right? Mm-hmm. Then what do you do? Like then, like do you give him some? Do you start giving him more ranked opponents? What if he beats them? You you oh. do. You start giving him more ranked opponents and see if he can come back from it. But I mean, how old is Tony right now? Thirty eight. Thirty seven. Thirty eight. Thirty nine. Somewhere. Yeah. There. And 38, you know, if he was in the lightweight or light heavyweight division or the heavyweight division, I'd be like, all right, maybe he maybe he can cut it there and still, like, make a comeback. This is a young man's sport. And that when you're already getting subbed, when you've never been subbed before, because I did look it up, that was his first time getting subbed. And your last couple of losses, or you've had a lot... Lo- a couple of knockout losses and you are prone to taking damage now or you've always been prone to taking damage but it's obviously accumulating to where you just can't you can't survive the same way that you do we all know that tony has the heart we all know that tony has the fight there but when your body's just not taking it the way that it used to and i don't i don't want him to tarnish his name anymore by just going down to the unranks being the gatekeeper to see if you should even be in the UFC. You know what I mean? I I think that his legacy is set, that that long win streak that he had, the interim title, I think he's already a Hall of Famer in my head. So I think he should just call it a career. And I love Tony. I agree. That's my boy. I agree. I agree with you on one thing and that his legacy is already set. I agree mm-hmm. with that. I don't think that you take a fighter's late career action into account when you're thinking about them as as it pertains to their greatness. Because, like, I mean, everybody knows Father Time is is undefeated. Not yeah. gonna, no one's going to escape the clock forever, no matter how good you are. Um, so, like, I don't mind them taking. If, I mean, for me, I, I I I say this a lot, and I stick I stand by this ten toes. The game will get rid of you when the game is ready to get rid of you. You don't have to, um, you know, make an exit. It'll, it'll show you when you're when you're ready. But like, because so, some of those guys still want to compete, and for the ones who still want to compete, I want to see it. You know what I mean, like, I don't want to. I don't want to. Like, so for, for, I'll give you an example of, of a guy that I thought stayed around too late that I wanted to see retire early. Samson Silva. I want to see Silva retire after the um the leg break. Mm-hmm. But he kept going and kept taking fights and I mean getting and keep getting losses by guys who's not can't can hold a candle to him in his prime. I don't think that tarnishes his legacy. To me, I think it kinda adds to it because I'm like, you're still willing to take fights when you aren't the hammer anymore. You're now the guy who's, I mean, it's like at one point in Tony Ferguson's run of that long unbeaten streak, he was the fucking man, in my opinion. And in, and Anderson Silva had stretches of his career where he was almost untouchable. But then now, you know, when the clock strikes back and like he's on, he's on the flip side of that, he's taking a fight with DC. What? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, and he's obviously not untouchable anymore. So to me, that adds, like, that makes me think of you, that gives me more respect for you as a fighter, taking those tough matchups, taking those unranked tough guys, because let's be real, even those guys that are making it to the UFC, those guys on the contender series, those guys that are on the circuit, that are working their way up, they're still killers. You know what I mean? They might not be to the caliber of the champion. Maybe not. Maybe not. But they're still the warriors. And I would if they if Tony wants to compete, still, I want to see him compete still. If even if even if Anderson, like if he's sitting there trying to box Jake Paul, I'm here for it. I'm like, until you like I don't think you 
tarnish your legacy by fighting late in your career. I don't think that's true. Because if you look at all the GOATs, every guy we consider a GOAT, Muhammad Ali, um, guys like fucking Floyd still taking fucking goofy ass fights, like exhibition fights. He's not losing them, but still he's taking them. It's just like no one remembers Ali for the late Ali. They remember Ali for the great Ali. And the same thing that I um with Tony. I don't think anyone's gonna remember this stuff. Him getting subbed by Nate Diaz. I mean they're gonna remember it, but they're not gonna remember his greatness for that. Let me rephrase a little bit. Like I don't think that we're ever gonna forget the legit Tony. So my example would be someone like BJ Penn. I love BJ Penn. He kept coming back for more and it just it hurt me. I, I like the guy too much to watch him take so much damage for no reason. That's where I was at with it. Because like when BJ Penn came out or came back multiple times, you could tell he was never in those fights. And he just got dominated, then dominated, then dominated. And he also, besides the Frankie Edgar fight, which was a terrible matchup for him at featherweight. All ten of them? All ten. Well, I mean, <laughs> the, the last two especially were just a terrible idea. And it just, it was, it was sad to see at this point. And it's leaked over into his personal life. The hot dogs and spam ain't working for him anymore. I think he's still trying to run for governor, but that's it's over. nowhere here or there. I thought he was trying again. Oh, again? Yeah, but here nor there. It's just that that hurts me to see. You know, at least Anderson switching over to boxing and boxing somebody like Jake Paul, that can still be competitive. Uh, the lower end of the UFC, if Tony really wants to drop down and take non-ranked opponents, which I think his pride is too much to do, he could probably do that, but I'd rather not him try to take all these ranked opponents like at 170 that I know he's just not favorable for. I want him to take winnable matchups at least. I don't want to be the I don't want to see him as a sacrificial lamb. I feel you. I feel you on that. Yeah. I, 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 from a fan standpoint, I feel you on that because you don't want to see yeah. your boy go out like that. Yeah. I get it. I get like it. I can handle his record right now. Like you even look at it and you're like, oh well, Tony lost to Justin Gaethje, Charles Oliveira, Darnoosh. Like those are like the top of the top, you know. But when you're no offense to Nate, because I love Nate also, but when you're getting subbed by Nate later in your careers and you're just not looking as creative or fast anymore it's there, there's a time where you just gotta kind of as a fan i just kind of want you to preserve yourself a little bit start focusing on other ventures in life which i know you already started true no i, I didn't get that and i don't think tony's um i think tony's aware of that mm -hmm. like he's 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 venturing out and doing. He, he he's. A, I think he's. His persona of him being this crazy guy is uh, a little bit overblown. I think he got, he he has at least um, a good team surrounding him, so he'll be fine as far as that's concerned. But that desire that you have to compete, it, once you stop, a lot of the, you, you hear a lot of the guys talk about it. Um, a lot of the former fighters. They talk about it pretty pretty heavily. Mm -hmm. Once you stop, it just it that it's it's over, and it, a lot of guys have a tough time dealing with that. As you go from living most of your career as this that that's what you're defined as. You're known for being a fighter, and then once you're not a fighter, once you're not in training camps and getting ready for a big fight, and this is all, all these things, then it's like they kind of go through an identity crisis of like in their own real life and the fear of that keeps them going longer than they should um in some cases and in other cases they just don't that's just their mentality they're like they're born warriors and they're never gonna stop until literally they can't well i'll give you a i'll give him a second option a different option that i would 100 percent support tony ferguson's ground game has always been entertaining and great and I would love to see him take on some submission underground fights. 
talk to his boy Chael, take on some Submission Underground, a little less hard on the body, still completely winnable for him, don't have to worry about those heavy hits and cuts, and you know he can he can take some submissions, so I would love for him to compete there, get that competitive edge out, and still have a chance at winning some good fights, or good matches, and getting it done. Still be on TV. And we're showing Tony Tony Ferguson a lot of love. Mm -hmm. Let's let's talk about how about this? Let's talk about that finish in the um was it Irene Aldana and Macy Chazon? Was that the fight? Which fight was it with the liver with the liver shot? That was the Aldana fight. Yeah, that was the one. Bruh. I looked away. I was playing. So I, at that time, um, when that card happened, I kind of I, I, I skipped between watching <laughs> the, the fight at a um, poker game and then at the strip club. So like the strip club hosted the event. They had, they they do the UFC all the time. Um, let me give a shout out to my boys at New Solid Gold for putting on a good show. Um, so I split time between that and the private game, and, and the, at the game. The, the prelims were on and like you know some of the main card and i'm watching it but in the, in the middle of it i'm also playing cards so i look up and i like i was ha i was i bet on macy and i was happy because i'm like oh we're winning this fight and then like she's on top and she's you know trying to some ground and pound i look up and she's on the ground like curled up i'm like wait what the fuck happened <laughs> like, like i didn't like what did i miss in those like 14 seconds of my attention not being on the tv then I went back and watched, and that, they showed the replay. I'm like, bro, she hit her with an up kick? Is, a, it's, is that to the liver? You know what I mean? She just crumpled, and I'm like, yo, that was brutal. Must have been a fucking crazy amount of pain for her to not continue with, you know. Wow. I mean, you rarely see up kicks that aren't knockouts to the chin. You see, like, you rarely see people, like, just get folded by a body kick. A body a up kick from to the body. Do you think that technique? The reason I wanted it up in the first place is: Do you think that might become more prevalent? Like you might see guys going for that more. Like people like attempting to go for body strikes with their up kicks more. Maybe. I mean, we saw it with the the front kick a long time ago. Once somebody started doing a front kick and they started getting a couple knockouts with it, that became a lot more prevalent and. The UFC, same with calf kicks. So why not up kicks to the body? Yep. Things like that work become trends. Facts. No, it's specifically targeting the organs, like trying to get a liver shot, trying to get a kidney shot. I mean, it's uh, targeting the chin. The chin is a small area, bro. Like trying to get a head kick from from up kick, you got a small window, and some of it's illegal because you because yep. if they get their knee on the ground, you can't hit them in the head. So. I, I think we, um, Irene might have started a little. She might have been the, maybe the Kickstarter, no pun intended, to a new trend. But we're seeing some up kicks to the body, um, especially specifically targeting the organs. Because like, like you said, it's, it's copycat. It's, a, it's, it's definitely a copycat league. When, when calf kicks start, when they, they, people do what's effective, and when you see when we saw calf kicks take a. Um, Go to go. I mean, become the, the the norm. We saw front kicks to the face become the norm after a few knockouts. It just I think um, when you whenever you do something that is is uncommon and you get a finish with it, everyone wants to do it. Everyone wants to try spinning back elbows for the finish. Now everybody wants that because it's like that highlight reel. So yeah, I mean, Mo, what do you think? You think that's going to be a thing? It's definitely going to be a thing. Everybody copies everybody. They even try to do some, uh, you know, who's the innovator is John Jones. I swear he comes up with something new every time. So, yeah, he he's definitely innovated a lot of those random attacks. Oh yeah, you got, I guess you, you could consider him the godfather of the oblique kick. Everybody hates on um on my boy. Um, damn, lost the name for a second there. Whitaker. 
No, Whitaker is a Tory for it too. No, Whitaker's great at it, but no, not Whitaker. Um, Khalil Roundtree for like what he did to old boys. Um, me, mm-hmm. me. Yeah. I'm like just because his was like a lot. It, it, it landed effectively. I mean, that's what it's, it's supposed to do. It's supposed to fucking break your leg. Like it's it's, 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 it's the, the whole point of that kick. If you land it, um, how brutally he did land it. You know, like that was like a perfect shot is to disable your opponent's leg. Same with any leg kick. I'm like, if you throw in a calf kick and you destroy it, like the person's limping now and that leg's disabled. Um, yeah. You land a head kick, that person's knocked the fuck out. You know what I mean? Like we, so it's, I think um, John might be the godfather of the oblique kick, was what they call it. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's also, he started the, I don't say started it, but at least in MMA, he kind of coined the spinning back elbow. But now you got Meatball Molly back to back, spinning back elbow knockouts, um, and a ton of other um, competitors just making their highlight reel with that technique. So, yeah, I mean, even uh, what was it? The Von Flute choke became a thing for a while. People started learning how to do the Von Flute or the OSP at this point but they started doing that more and more often when they were in certain guards so why not that's that's how you learn but one thing about the oblique kick like a little side note on that i don't understand why everyone hates it so much i understand it can destroy a knee or like it's very dangerous to use for the person getting hit by it but a your job is to avoid all this heavy damage in the first place and B, we have people breaking people's arms, ripping people's knees apart, and submissions constantly. But you can't throw a kick at it? Like, I don't see the difference in my head. I think the reason why people object to it the most is because we like to pick and choose our violence. Yeah. <laughs> like, we like to pick and choose what we like to see when it comes to violence. So like that, they like, they might see that as that being unfair or that being um, like, even with, um, remember back when soccer kicks, soccer kicks were allowed in like pride days and then um, how knees were grounded opponent was allowed in the early days of the UFC and in the pride days. It, it just looks more brutal than it really is. And I'm, I'm like, if you're allowed to pick a guy up and slam him on his head, if you're allowed to elbow a ground opponent, if you're allowed to kick a guy in the head, knee a guy in the face, standing, why can't you do it on the ground? Like if you, it's 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 weird that we just like to cherry pick which parts of violence we like. like it's okay to get hit over and over in the he- head with your with basically what amount like in boxing what amounts to like I mean. They're wrapping these guys' hands up in gloves, but let's be real here. That's just way more brutal getting hit repeatedly in the head over the course of 12 rounds than it ever is one clean kick. You know what I mean? But it's more accepted. It just looks more presentable. It's kind of like, uh, <laughs> I guess it's like the McDonald's of like strikes. Like It looks good in the package, but you know it's trash. <laughs> yep, it certainly is. Definitely. Yeah, it's it, that's definitely a bad concept of MMA. Soccer kicks, I kind of get because it's really hard to defend yourself from them on the ground. Versus a head kick, you have a lot of options to defend yourself. But yeah, I get it. It's it's terrible that people think that way. The only argument for oblique kicks that I can I can think of that's kind of legitimate is you can tap out to a submission, but you can't tap out to a strike. Well, you can tap out to strikes too, but once that hit, it goes and blows out your knee. It's already gone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, here's my, here's my defense of soccer kicks. Don't get there. 
<laughs> I mean, like, like you don't you have an option to not be on the ground. Every fight starts standing. If you get knocked down, then I mean, you, you failed at your objective. So that means you're at the mercy of the the person striking you. And if yeah. you're going for grappling exchanges, if you're trying to take this guy down, it gives him other weapons to defend against the takedown. That's my only thing with soccer kicks that I'm why I'm pro soccer, soccer kick because I think that grappling has too many edges. If you if you tell if you make if you want to make it real, make it to where you can defend in a real way. If someone's trying to take me down on the streets, and he gets a he gets a single on me, I can bridge, uh, put my hand on the back of his neck, get my foot out of there, and now he's crouched and trying to go for another single, and I can, and I can just punt him into to like the next you know town. I'm fucking punting that guy. You know what I mean, like, and in, 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 in the same MMA, like, if, yeah, because you see scramble opportunities where guys are, like, in transition and they're fighting off a takedown and you see guys chain wrestling going for more takedowns. If you add in that element, it changes it. It changes how it can't be as reckless with those chain wrestling attempts where you just get risk, get kicked in the face with your face right next to my shed. So I, I'm pro soccer kick. I think it will make the game better, not worse. Um, and it, I don't care that it looks more violent. I'm here for violence. That's what the whole the whole sport is revolved around. The ultimate fighting championship. It's not the ultimate sportsman championship. Like no one cares that it looks clean and neat. I'm not that no one. Obviously, people care that it looks clean and neat. But it's supposed to be a fight. And if you're simulating a fight, I mean, obviously, you don't want people getting poked in the eyes. You don't want people. Bending fingers or gouging people's eyes. Outside of that, I'm cool with all the strikes. I'm 100% pro uh, knees on the ground. Shout out to Mighty Mouse getting his revenge. But uh, yeah, I'm 100% all about knees on the ground, though. Bro, wasn't that wasn't that a beautiful sequence? Oh, 100% beautiful. And it, it just made it so much better that when he first got into MMA or into one one FC. He got that knockout by the knee on the ground. Probably because he wasn't really expecting it. He was still used to the old rule set, but he got his revenge. And shout out to him still being a world champ. Worst trade ever. Yes. Worst trade ever. <laughs> they can yeah. take back Ben. <laughs> and you, I love how knees are involved heavily in that whole trade story because Ben Askren came over from one with all this like all these accolades right like he was just this like um, undefeated you know grappler and then like he took then he, Masvidal sent him to retirement with that flying knee Mighty Mouse goes over loses the title to a basically a flying knee on the ground it wasn't, a, it wasn't a flying knee but it was a knee on the ground um Right after he was a proponent for that rule, like being changed, he's like, "I like that," and I don't. Yeah. Really, I agree. I don't think it's like. I think it's fine, and then for him to get sweet revenge on the same exact guy to get his title back, a time flying knee after he rocked him with that right hand—that's just fucking poetic justice for Mighty Mouse. And we gotta start for real, given. One, it's props for putting on good shows. Like those fights are always fun, man. Yeah, it's amazing. And as me and Mosey were talking about earlier, the mix up and types of fights that they have over there with kickboxing and Muay Thai, and then sometimes mixing them up to where they're in cages or in rings. It's it's nice. It's different. It's a little Ryzen esque, only not so showboaty as Ryzen is. Ryzen puts on some ex exhibitions that shouldn't happen, but <laughs> I think one does it right. Yeah, Ryzen gets a little bit of experimental. <laughs> you Ryzen know wants to be the old pride. <laughs> you know, bro, I'm going to tell you right now, you know who don't give a fuck? Oh, the Russians. If you watched all the M1 Global stuff and like some of those, like, um, the other Russian promotions, man, they put on some crazy type shit. Hey, their uh, press conferences be off the chain, too. They be fighting there. Mm -hmm. 
and no one cares. So, yeah. So every every like one out of three Russian press conferences is on site. Yes. Like one out of three. They they be running up on you while you're sitting in the chair still. It's it's crazy. Plus no, emotions over see. there are just random about stuff where they're like, you know what we should do? We should have a four on four or an eight on eight MMA fight. <laughs> okay. Bro, listen, the other day, I think they, they do they that. Have, this, the Russians, I think this is this is this is how they do theirs. Everything that you see in like the YouTube chat, like that, they're a YouTube chat of MMA. Like they they have uh, they don't have. Three lightweights versus one heavyweight, <laughs> like it's <laughs> like it's crazy. Like they have some fucking ridiculous bots, and like I was, I was it was crazy because I'm like, okay, man, you got three guys at well, not three lightweights, sorry, it was like three featherweights. It's like three guys at 145 against one dude that was a, a heavyweight, and I'm like, that fight went exactly how you think that would go. Like you know what I mean? I'm like, they just all rushed him and they like start stomping him out. I'm like, bro, it's like yeah. I don't know, it's crazy. They have like those what if type fights. Like what if you put a transgender woman against an actual man? What do you think is going to happen? And they fucking send it. And then like, you're like, oh, it's still a man. <laughs> like it's crazy, bro. Like they put some, the Russians, bro, they go hard. I think Almost they to a point where, like they, 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 so I, I'm, I'm, like I said, I am for the violence, but sometimes I watch this stuff and I feel like bad. I'm like, I shouldn't be seeing this shit, man. <laughs> I mean, to an extent, I also feel the fact that they all signed up for that and they're all getting paid to do exactly that, so they knew what they were getting into. So therefore, I don't feel that bad, but I still don't understand why it's a thing. I don't feel bad. I, I guess I, I, I use the wrong, like... I guess what I wanted to say was, like, it is just a train wreck. Like I'm not gonna look away. I'm gonna fucking watch it. But I'm like, I'm like, I just look at it like in in awe, almost. Like I I can't believe this got sanctioned. <laughs> like someone, like somebody was like, yeah, for sure, run that. I'm yeah, cool with it. Like, let's do an intergender fucking MMA match. Like, or let's do like a fucking. That, that the three on one one had me just it just sent me bro. And I saw like, hey, isn't that the place like, that had the four hundred pound guy against the the woman, the like the bantamweight yes. woman? That was Russia. Was that or Russia or was that Ryzen? I think that was Russia. When with the really big dude and the um, the, the Muay Thai girl. Yeah. Yeah, that was, I think that was that was right. I think that was um that was one of those Russian promotions. Oh, uh, Ryzen was the one with uh. What what's her name? Gabby, that like two hundred oh, pound oh my God. behemoth of a woman fighting a grandma. Oh my god! A, a professional wrestler grandma that was like at eighty, like I want to say like eighty, or in her seventies. And I'm like, what is this? She's one hundred and four, bro. Who said that we wanted to see She Hulk against a grandma? Like. What is going I'll, on? I'll, I'll tell you who. I'll tell you who. Russians. They want. They want all the smoke. They want to <laughs> see the. They want to see somebody get fucked up. They were like, "Oh, you." I, I like how. Um, like I guess I think it's just all the. They just take the comments and be like, "Oh, that's a good idea. Let's fucking do that." They just run it. What would happen if you put three one hundred and thirty-five pound guys against one two hundred and five pound guy? What do you think would happen? Let's fucking find out. Are you guys ready to call it, man? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Definitely. Uh, I got no video today because I guess, like, my I got to figure this out. So you got to look at my pristine, shiny little ball head. Um, <laughs> my my uh, photograph. I'll be, if you're on YouTube, if you're just listening to it on audio, then you get what you get already. But we'll be back for, we're back after a long time. Um, got some schedule changes for the homies. And um, we, we can try to bring you some more fun content. Uh, like and subscribe if you are on YouTube. Uh, and this is also everywhere you get podcasts. We appreciate you, all listeners, all viewers, all six of you. 
So uh, holla at your boy. Well, on that note, zip it up. Zip it out. Zip it out, baby.